Hello and welcome back to Grafter Branch Ministry. As always, I'm Scotty Herb, and today's lesson, every idle word, okay? I'm gonna be dissecting this a little bit, and well, passage mainly found in Matthew 12, 36, so I want you to go ahead and turn there in your King James Bible with me, all right? Let's go ahead and jump straight into this one. Got a lot of scripture to go over. Matthew 12, 34 is where we will start. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give, an, uh, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So right where we end there, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the gospel way of salvation, but every mouth that confesses the Lord Jesus and believes in his heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. By thy words thou shalt be condemned also. Are you believing in vain? Have you called on the right Jesus? Or do you sit there in doubting about with strife and words? Okay, does your tongue deceive you? Are you truly calling on God in faith? Romans chapter 10 verse 9 is that passage for salvation. I'm going to go ahead and touch on that real quick. Go ahead and go over there with me. Keep a finger in Matthew 12 or a bookmark something. We're going to be coming back to that passage throughout this study. Okay. Romans chapter 10, though. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So, what do you speak? Do you sit there and say, um, uh, mm, every idle word, as it read in verse 36, you shall give an account for? I don't know of a more idle word than, um, or, uh, like, <laughs> how often is that one used? Oh, this is like, 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 like this, and, and then there's like, um, uh, a lot of idle words in today's vocabulary okay and it's not only the youth but there's a lot of elder people there's even those that'll sit there and they rattle on and rattle on and every other word is a cuss word aside from just a, a educational perspective looking at that and saying well okay if everybody every other word in somebody's mouth is either the b word the f word pick your choice of a letter in the alphabet and a four letter word that follows <sighs> they're just showing their ignorance okay their ignorance and lack of understanding or lack of use to to find a different word to use something that's a little bit more uh, smart <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. I want to sound a little sophisticated myself right here, but it doesn't take much to realize that somebody that just sits there and, and just bleep, 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 bleep out of their mouth, they're condemning themselves continuously. My dog found a stick. <laughs> Talk about a series of idle words right there in the middle of this study. Don't let them bother you too much from what's being covered here. So let's come back. Okay, another key part of this passage in Matthew 12, right? So we know at the end in verse 37, it says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Verse 34, Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. I'm going to be touching on that here in a moment, but out of the abundance of the heart, and no, it's not talking about your heart. The, the scientific organ that they named the heart that doesn't look nothing like a duality symbol, okay? So don't draw the duality symbol and call that a heart. And if you don't know what I'm talking about by the duality symbol, do some research. If you call yourself a Christian, you'll probably start to not use a heart shape 
duality symbol for anything anymore. And this is kind of me just rambling on now here. Talk about an idle word study, and here I am just going on, carrying on. But <clears throat> a lot of people sit there and text message, or they'll have their Facebook or whatever. Do you think that God is going to hold every idle word that we even type or write? If you still write physical letters and send them to people, are those going to be given an account for it also? I believe so. I'm going to be going through a lot of scripture on, on all this. But the key passage, okay, verse 36 in, Ma in Matthew chapter 12. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Let's go ahead and go to Proverbs 21, 23. Again, hold your place in Matthew 12. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23. Proverbs 21, verse 23, we read, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue, keepeth his soul from trouble. Next verse, verse 24, didn't have planned to go here, but just reading through it real quick. Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. How many times have you seen people, as soon as an argument or a debate starts happening, they get their blood pressure gets boiled. The boys start raising, and they start pointing fingers and yelling at people. Don't be afraid to admit fault if you're one of them. I know I am. I have been. And I beg the Lord to forgive me. And I've tried to clean up my speech for a very long time. There for a while, uh, I'm recording this, it's May 8th, and around December time frame, me and my wife Hannah, Sister Hannah, we spent a good long effort to try and clean up our ums and uhs and saying the word like. And then as I build this study to actually present it, I had already studied it out back then, but to actually present this study to y'all here, the devil starts working on you and starts bringing those mistakes back up. Starts having the flesh slip up. There's three things that are going to harm you. It's the devil, the world, and the flesh. Every idle word that you have driven by your flesh and your lust, is going to, you're going to give an account for. Every idle word that you have that is covetous. Oh, I want that. Ooh, isn't that nice? Oh, isn't that pretty? Oh, I want my team to go to the Super Bowl. Every idle word you're going to give an account to. Let alone the devil. How many times, or how many of you that are watching this, after that you called on Jesus Christ to save you, slipped up and cussed? Said one of those four letter, letter words that we're not supposed to say. And then you felt guilty for it, did you not? There's a reason. And the, devil, the devil was trying to work on you right there. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. Got a lot of scripture to go through. I'm hoping that this study won't take too long, but I mean, you already know how long it takes. You're watching it. You can press the pause button and look. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doubting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envying, strife, railing, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, 
supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. All those things that I was just mentioning a moment ago are packed in right here. What are the three things that are going to harm you in this life? What are your three main enemies as a Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian? Your flesh, the world, and the devil. Your flesh is often going to have that evil surmisings, the railings come up, the strife. Talked about that. The world, greediness. Do you suppose that gain is godliness? Or do you have contentment as in verse 6? And then of course, there's the perverseness of the devil. The disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Without an understanding, they start talking about something just because of the way that they feel. Because of the way that the devil just notioned them right then, when it, whatever is going on. And so don't get caught up being one of those that are proud and knowing nothing. Doubting about words and strifes of men. Now you could say, sure enough, every idle word, oh well, don't, don't get mad at me, Scotty, if, if I say um, or I like to say the word like. Oh, this is like when I was doing this and like, um, you know, you know, the, the, the thing that's like this. Every idle word you will give an account to. Doesn't matter what I say. And if you're feeling convicted, it cut me first, too. I sit here and often between me and my wife, Hannah, sister Hannah, We'll catch ourselves, oh, no ums. Like, we'll be talking about something and she'll ask me, oh, well, what was Brother Dontavius talking about? And I'll be like, oh, well, um, and there it was. I just caught it. I'll be like, oh, well, each of those are idle words. You see how easy it is to slip up? This brings us to our next point. Going back to Matthew 12, 35, Matthew 12, verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of, his, of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Now, sure enough, sure enough, each of these idle words we will give an account to. But if you're a good man out of the good treasure of your heart, you will probably speak good things, even if it is those idle words like um and like. And if you're trying to correct those things, it's going to produce unto more godliness, not ungodliness, if you allow the ungodliness to rule in your life. Back to verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And it talks about, for the good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. It's talking about what you're speaking. And the evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, brings forth evil things. Go with me. Go with me to the book of James, chapter 3. Some of you that know your scriptures, already know that this is talking about the tongue. And if, you don't, if this is your first time reading this passage, I want you to pause and reread it after we go through it and I talk a little bit about it. Just edify yourself a little bit. Let the Word of God speak unto you. Okay? And we're looking at James chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. If you offend not in a word at all, ever, you're able to bridle and control the whole body. Behold, verse 3, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body talking about the body of the horse. Verse 4, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, 
and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they churned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a member, a matter, a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among your members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. Your, your tongue can put your body in a world of hurt. I know I'll raise my hand. When I was in high school, I used to like to fight a lot when I was a lost man, lost young man. Even when I was in the army, I used to get drunk and go downtown Waikiki, yes, I was stationed in Hawaii, and I would search out fights because I thought it was fun. It was stupid. And often, you know how those fights start? The tongue. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It just takes one word and you're going to make somebody mad. Looking again, back at verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Give me one second. My pup is way out there. Hey, boy! Hey! Come on! Come on! Come here. <laughs> Look at how well a dog will be obey. Hey, come sit. Come here. Good boy. Sit. That's bridled. That's controlled. How many people do you know that'll act like that? Dog can't speak. I mean, sure, I can teach him the trick, speak, and he... Woof! But... Can he say words? Is he going to put himself into trouble? He might put himself into trouble sometimes, chewing up toilet paper rolls and other things like that, or my socks. But my tongue was able to bridle him as I called him. Hey, come here, sit. Good boy. Sit. No, down. Sit. Behave. Trying to give an example here. Yes, boy. Anyways, back to the study. Okay. So as our tongue is just a little member, it can stir up a whole lot of fire. Do you know how to control it? What's in the abundance of your heart? Did a short a while back Oh, by the time this video comes out, it'll probably be two, three months. But I did a short, and it was simply, you know, where do you lay up your treasures? Is it in heaven, or is it in earth? Where you store your treasures, that's where your heart will be also. Kind of ties in right here. Verse 35, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth good things. Are your treasures up in heaven? Do you speak, speak of heavenly things? How often do you bring up scripture to family? Or friends or co-workers? How often are you caught talking about worldly things in the next new hot car that's coming out on the market? Or new video game? You looking forward to a smoke break or something? Or do you, do you like a particular alcohol? Every idle word you're going to give an account for. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs, chapter 26, verse 28. Proverbs 26, verse 28. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. You know, if I sat here and I didn't preach against these things, I didn't bring up the thing of every idle word we will give an account for, all according to the, the Word of God, 
It's not so much what Scotty says, or Philip says, or Brian says, Steve, John, Joe, whatever. It doesn't matter what any of these men say. What does the Word of God say? Okay? And we define Scripture with Scripture. And flattering lips lead to ruin. If I sat here and just boasted you up and made you feel good and gave these feel-good messages all the time, what good is it going to do you? It's going to lead you to ruin, ultimately. But out of the good treasure of my heart, I speak the things of Scripture. And yes, they do offend people sometimes. Because people aren't ready to hear it. Or they're built up on their pride. They have contention with me because they follow after a different religion. I have to check on my pup. He likes to wander off into the fields. The other day he almost got over to the road. He was checking out the really big dogs across the way, the cows. Don't know if you can see them on the camera. Now, that one's a bull. I'm pretty sure you can make out the bull. But... <clears throat> Yeah, so the tongue. The tongue is just a small member, but how much strife can it stir up? Go with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Got some one-off verses here. Colossians 4, verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. If you've watched my discipleship studies, they're kind of old. I was even more of a novice than I am now in preaching the blessed word. But a point made in that study was that we are to have salt with saltiness. Because if your salt it loses its saltiness, you're no longer preaching the word of God. You're no longer cutting somebody with the word of God chastising them, correcting them with the Word of God, then you have no salt. Salt hurts a wound, sure enough. Salt adds flavor to things. Almost any food, any meal, if it's not flavorful enough, add a little salt to it. It brings that flavor right out. And our speech needs to always be seasoned with salt so that we may give an account read it again, Colossians. I already turned from it. You're probably still there. It's a good listener. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6. Let your speech always be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. And it's speaking in accordance with this word. Every idle word that you speak, every idle word that I speak, each of these studies, even the ones that I've made mistakes in, okay? As I'm catching them now that I'm more inclined, I've, done, I've been seasoned plenty. Not only with experience, but with plenty of salt and plenty of hurt. I've been cut by this word I don't know how many times. Correcting my life. By other brethren bringing up, hey, brother, this section of scripture says this, what are you doing? And I've been chastised. Do you allow yourself to be chastised? Do you love this word? Or are you boasted up? Either in the flesh, or the world, or by the devil. Go with me also to Titus chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. Titus 2, verse 7 through 8. Now let's start in verse 6. But pay attention to the word likewise. Right? And this is coming down from the line of, of bishops. But likewise, Christians are supposed to behave a certain way. So verse 6. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of work of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptibleness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, 
having no evil thing to say of you. But they can have evil things to say of us when we slip up. When we enable their sin. When you don't speak against hell. And the condemnation that be on some of your co-workers, family, friends. That's a pretty sobering thought. Being sober-minded. Bear in mind hell and damnation. And just the torment that's involved with that. Luke chapter 15, I believe it is, talking about Lazarus and then the rich man that go down to hell. And the rich man calls out from the torments of hell and he just asked that Lazarus would dip his finger in some water to drop it on his tongue. And that's all he wants. But he can't have it because nothing can cross that great gulf. Pretty sober in thought, ain't it? The book of Jude, Jude, verse 14 through 18. You might be asking if you're newly saved. What chapter? Well, there's only one. Jude 14 through 18. Speaking of being sober-minded and talking about the things of hell and the condemnation that lays upon them from the judgment of God, if they do not adhere to the word of God, look at the example that Enoch lived and the speech that he had. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to con convince all that are ungodly among them that among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him these are murmurers complainers walking after their own lust and their mouth speaketh great swelling words having men's persons in admiration because of advantage I guess we can keep going down through 18 like I said but beloved remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust ungodly sinners which they have ungodly committed these sins and these deeds and ungodly committed <laughs> just saying ungodly 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 you bunch of heathens is what enoch is saying but he had sound speech you see according to the word of god every out of word you know if our speech was always like that i bet you we would have a lot of gold silver precious stones when we get up to the judgment seat of Christ and we're put through the fire to see what kind of works we had. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, go with me to 1 Corinthians, or no, it's 2 Corinthians 5, excuse me. Wait, is it 1 Corinthians? Well, we know 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Are you doing that? But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 it's actually the passage I wanted to go to. First uh, Corinthians three, verse verse twelve. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, hmm. because it shall be revealed by fire, 
and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Hey, Abel, come here. Come here, boy. He's about 50 yards away. He comes running over here. Hey, sit, boy, sit. Are you this obedient to Christ? Do you control your tongue? Do you have riches laid up in heaven? Good boy. Yeah, no, stay down. Still having fun and enjoying life. But when he's called, he comes. You get that little inclination in your mind. Hey, you should speak up right now. And instead of speaking up and speaking on the things of God, yeah, sure enough, you might speak up, but then you just say something worldly. Oh, how, how about them Yankees this year? Every idle word we're going to give an account for. Do you think that's going to come out as precious gold? Or do you think it's going to come out as wood, hay, and stubble? Instead, your friend asks you if you're wanting to go to the bar, and instead of saying, oh, how about them Yankees, you say, hey, you know what? We shouldn't go drink. That's a sin. Just earn some rewards right there. Every idle word we're going to give an account for. Matthew 12, 36, if you remember. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. How obedient are you when God calls you to action? It's actually quite a, quite a profound thing, if you think about it. First started with, from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Okay, where, where do you lay up your treasures at? Okay, those that lay up good treasures for themselves, they'll speak on good things. Those that lay up evil treasures for themselves, they'll speak of evil things. Those treasures that it's talking about, and from the abundance of the heart, is your imaginations, your thoughts. The meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. That's another passage, though. But go with me to, uh, let's go to First Chronicles first. First Chronicles chapter 28 verse 9 I'm going to show you something interesting here 1st Chronicles chapter 28 verse 9 and thou Solomon my son here's David giving some instructions unto his son before he dies know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Quite a thing. If thou seek him, if you're trying to lay up those good treasures in your heart, things will just work out. If you're seeking after God, God's going to work with you. If you forsake him, he's going to forsake you also. But more importantly here, did you know that God understands all the imaginations of the thoughts? Did you know that it's because of the imaginations of the thoughts that God caused the flood? Go with me to Genesis chapter 6. Quite an interesting thing here. <laughs> Talk about saying that word even. Interesting. It's not scriptural. At least I don't think it is. Mainly because there was a run-in I had a while back with some, some Mormons. And as I was talking to them and witnessing to them and I was telling them what's written in Scripture, they just kept on saying, oh, that's very interesting, very interesting. And they didn't want to turn there to the chapter and verse I was telling them. Regardless, that aside, Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Abel, come here. Hold on one second. 
Think about that, though. The imaginations of the thoughts. I'm trying to get Abel inside. Come on. Go on. Excuse me. Uh, but again, obedient. Neighbor had their dog out, and I didn't want, you know, older couple with a young pup. It's easier for them to control them. But God wanted to destroy the whole earth because of the wickedness of man, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. No one on earth, save Noah, was trying to lay up riches in heaven, had their treasure in the good treasure of their heart. From the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Enoch, just beforehand, before here, was translated. Yeah, and in chapter 5, Wait, that's Enos. I'm trying to find Enoch real quick. Ah, chapter 4, Enoch. Verse 18. That's when he was born, anyways. On with the study, though. Because, speaking of Enoch, just before then, he's walking around, you have ungodly done this, ungodly done that. Ungodly, ungodly. And then he was translated. He was resurrected, in other words. Taken out of this world without having to see death. Type of the catching away. But now, the imagination of the thought, by the grace of God, those of us that are saved, we can bring into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. As I was just saying with Abel, my dog, every time I called him, he came. When I gave him the command, hey, sit, he would sit right at my feet. Are you that obedient unto Christ? You start to wander off in that thought. Oh, it'd be cool to just listen to some music while I'm while I'm driving to work. It, oh, it, it's a little worldly, but I, I really like this one. And you start going. You hear that small, still voice in the back of your head. You shouldn't be listening to this. Oh, it's, it's okay. You try and convince yourself otherwise. Every imagination of the thoughts. Where are you laying up your treasure? And then later through that day, how many idle words do you speak that are going to burn up as wood, hay, and stubble? But we have the opportunity through the power of God, the grace of God. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. or 2 Corinthians 10, excuse me. And we'll go to verse 5. I want to cover this one first. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath also given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Oh, I'm reading... I'm reading chapter 5, verse 5. Forgive me. Every idle word, yet still. Maybe you guys just need to emphasize that. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen? <laughs> First, or 2 Corinthians 5, 7. I was about to read, and that's when I recognized where I was. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Now let's actually do it. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You know that the opposite of believing isn't unbelief, but it's disobedience. For if you truly believe something, would you not be obedient unto it? If you truly believe every word that's in this book here, are you not going to be obedient unto it when somebody corrects you or shows you something new? If 
1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 15 now, where I started to go and then started thinking, wait, I want to go to 2 Corinthians first. But now we're going to it, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 15. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it as those thoughts those imaginations come in whoa and then you bring that thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ and then your disobedience is revenged by your obedience that's how that works. Every time that small, still voice with the temptation, God was making a way of escape. Did he take the way of escape? Or did he make excuses? Even if it's to another or to yourself, every idle word you're going to give an account for. Continuing down to verse 16. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is, no, is it not communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Another sobering thought there, but how often do you think on those things? The sacrifice that was made that you might have such a great salvation. Does it control your thoughts? Does it help you control and tame your tongue so that you can tame the rest of your body? Speaking of the thoughts and the imaginations and every idle word that we're going to give an account for, go to chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Amen? Amen? In your understanding, be men, but in malice be children. Don't be so quick to anger. When somebody says something, just understand that that's the foolishness of their heart that they have ungodly committed. Correct them according to the word of God. Earn some riches, lay up treasures, amen? The good treasures of your heart will serve you right. And this is why we therefore preach to others, 1 Corinthians chapter three, verse eight through 10. Already covered some of this. First Corinthians three, eight through ten. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. You represent him in, those, in other words. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he build thereupon. Second Peter 2, or 2 Timothy 2, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also as you hear these things rather from me philip brian dillinger whatever other big mouth baptist that you might have heard and gleaned a little bit good from okay each of the men that i listed i would i would recommend But be careful who you listen to. For what you take in is what you're going to put out. And every idle word that you, that you do put out, as you listen 
and you take instruction, you're going to start teaching others the same. Are you ready to give an account? Because as you teach and instruct others, you're definitely going to give an account for that. Second Corinthians five. Second Corinthians chapter five. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, what is this ministry of reconciliation? To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed, you're committed with something, unto us the word of reconciliation. How often do you speak on it? How often do you bring up Romans 10.9? How often do you bring up 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4? How that Christ died shedding his blood, how that Christ shed his blood upon the cross according to scriptures and that he died and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures for every mouth that confesseth Romans 10 9 and every heart that believeth that God hath raised him from the dead shall be saved let your preaching be simple, brethren. Finally, go with me to First Corinthians two. Or right, you know what? Let's start in chapter one. First Corinthians chapter one. Make sure you always turn in the King James Bible. Make sure you always tell others to turn in their King James Bible. Also, First Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Hmm. Verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But you are. John 15, 16 tells us that you have not chosen him, but he has chosen you and ordained you to bring forth fruit. Do you? What are your idle words? Idle, uh, idle words like? It's starting to rain a little bit, so I'm thinking about other things. Trying not to get my Bible wet. Chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Or let's start in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Doesn't take much. But how much do you believe it? If you truly believe it, and when you're preaching on the gospel, do you say, um? Do you say, this is like? How many idle words do you put in there when you say, for whosoever shall confess, confess the name of Jesus Christ and shall believe that God hath raised him from the dead shall be saved? Or do you stumble and say, um, and like, when you talk about how that Jesus died according to scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures? Or do you get caught up talking about different things of theology and philosophy aside from Jesus Christ and this word? Pretending that it's pertaining to this, but every idle word going to give an account for. Let's 
Let's go ahead and close. Going back to Matthew 12, verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Take the word of God as it is, brethren. Hope this message was a blessing unto you. And if I don't see you again before at the feet of Jesus, stay strong. Stay true. Keep up the good fight of faith. Bye now.